So they say that Christmas is the most wonderful time of the year, but I disagree. It's the third week of March. It's this week in Kansas City, Missouri, because it is the NCAA Wrestling Championships, Jail. And you and I are both going, and we're both very excited. I'm feeling it. I got three generations. I got Grandpa, my son, myself. We are counting down the days. What's up, guys? Welcome to another episode of Good Guy, Bad Guy. I'm Daniel Cormier, the good guy, and that's the bad guy, Chael Sonnen. Chael Sonnen, how you doing, my guy? Never better, man. I'm fired up. I'm ready to get into these fights from the weekend. Absolutely. Hey, talking about the fight this weekend, we had two heavyweights. Go at it. And as you would expect, Tai Tuivasa went after Marcin Tybura. Marcin Tybura ultimately won the fight by submission. But, Chael, we're not here to talk about the fight. We're here to talk about what happened after the fight as we get into our call-outs. This one here, Chael, had me very confused because generally on a call out, you know what's something, well, you know what's accomplished when it's done. But I don't know what happened with Marcin Tybro. Take a listen, Chill. Well, I, you know, I just want to prove everybody that I'm still uh, capable of doing good this in the top 10. And so right now it's just to proving. Uh, I don't know. I didn't prepare any name because I'm coming out of the loss. So I really want to focus on this one. I don't have one, but anyone, anyone from the top 10 would be great. Would be great for me. Mm. Chill. Every time it happens, I get yeah. secondhand embarrassment. It's like watching a kid trying to tell the auditorium that he wants to be the president of the school, but he's very sad. He's embarrassed. He doesn't know what to say. What in the world was Marcin Tybura doing, Chael? I had secondhand embarrassment watching and, him. And Daniel, I ran for president of the school, so I know that exact awkward <laughs> speech that you're talking about. Now, okay, we're going to take a guy at his word. I mean, even when Michael Bisping goes in and interviews him, he will say to him, all right, you know what's coming now. Who do you want to call out? I mean... Literally, they're teed up. There's, there's no wonder. So we will take him at his word. If he says, I want to fight John Doe, we will believe him. If he says he upset me or, or that's the next guy for me, we will accept it. But if he says anybody or he says, I don't care. And Daniel, that seems to be a big one, a version of I don't care. It's supposed to mean anybody. It's supposed to mean I have the courage to compete with anybody, but it's not what was said. And if we do take you at your word and you say you don't care, it's impossible for us to care. You and I would rather be sitting here right now building his next fight, trying to help him and influence the matchmakers, but he didn't give us anywhere to go. And it's almost as though, right or wrong, but it's almost as though psychologically for me, what I hear is, he didn't think he was going to win. He's surprised that he won. He didn't have anybody in mind because he didn't know he was going to be in this spot. You know what's crazy to me is when I watch these people, our fighters, one thing that annoys me, one, when I walk in there with that stick and I say, what do you want to see next? Oh, whatever the UFC decides. No, it's not whatever the UFC decides because if you do whatever the UFC decides, you will be a guy who's ranked in the top five in the world and you'll be fighting Yushin Okami, who's also in the top five in the world, and you'll be the first prelim to hit the curtain, Chael Sonnen and Yushin Okami, on a prelim of a pay-per-view. But when you take it into your own hands, then you start to work your way up the card. Then you start to matter. People start to care. You, you never have more eyes on you than whenever you are in that octagon with someone like myself, Michael Bisping or Joe Rogan. You get to call your shot. You don't say whatever the UFC decides next. Marcin Tybura got a great matchup in Tai Tuivasa. This is a guy with a name. But Tai Tuivasa, for as much as we all love him, he has a weakness. And he's always had that same grappling weakness. Tybura was able to exploit that and win the fight. Now you got momentum. You have to build on that momentum by saying something. And Chael, guess what? The more outrageous you can be inside the octagon, the better because then people start to care, opposed to you and I coming on a Monday going, ah, oh, man, I don't know what Tybura was doing. I feel like he dropped the ball there, and he will regret not having a name at the tip of his tongue the moment that microphone was stuck in his face. 
Well, and I love what you just said. Let me just help to prove your point. Uh, there was a young man named St. Denis who called out Dustin Poirier, and the commentator, Daniel Cormier, laughed. It was so silly that St. Denis, with a win over Frivola, was going to get in there with a star like Poirier, not to mention there was 10 spots in the rankings. It made no level of sense, but he got the conversation going. And before you know it, Daniel Cormier is apologizing to St. Denis as he's getting ready to call his fight against Poirier. And my only point on that... I think that maybe Tybora didn't want to get laughed at. Maybe he didn't want to get over his skis. But to your point, that's okay. Let us laugh at you. Let us tease it. But let us get the conversation going. You know, Chael, I laughed at him and he got the fight. Unfortunately, it was sometimes you ask for something you don't really want. But not only did he get the fight, he got it on a massive pay-per-view. And now his profile's raised even in defeat. One guy, though, that isn't afraid to call you out is Colby Covington. Colby Covington had some very interesting things to say about Ian Gary. Take a listen. Everybody knows when you're going fishing, it's important to have the right bait. So let me teach you all a lesson about how you bait someone. Ian Gary, you translucent You wanted my attention? Now you got it. Everybody knows why you want to fight me, Ian. I'm the biggest star in the division. It's big city, bright lights, and the most attention and eyes. But everybody knows, Ian, you missed your chance. You had your chance in December to step on the same stage as me and have a microphone and say whatever you want to say to me. But you were scared. You were scared of what I was going to say to you. And you got the sniffles and you cried your way out. If you're scared of words, what do you think it's going to be like when you step in a steel cage with chaos? Ball's in your court now, boy. I'll have my lawyers draft up the papers. You got 24 hours to respond. We'll see if you're about that life. Mm, mm, mm. Guys, Ian Gary said, you'll do as you're told. You're not America's favorite fighter. What you are is a peak underperformer. I'm going to be the final chapter in your legacy of failure. I'm going to rid the UFC of Colby Covington for good, and I'm going to make America great again. Chael, this is good because anytime you have a heel and a good guy, you start to build the story. When you start bringing in the loser leaves town match as the stipulation, that's always good. So it's it's like it always it draws me in. One, I'm not sure the world's ready to make Ian Gary the good guy, but I think with chaos, people are like, yo, I want to see this dude get held, feet held to the fire. How good of a heel is Colby Covington? Because I've seen some great ones like Jake the Snake Roberts. When he slapped Miss Elizabeth, you want to hate him so bad. It seems like Kobe is doing that. He's okay with being hated. So does that make a great heel, Chael? Well, well, and Daniel, how interesting because... What a difference a day makes. Ian Gary was one of the biggest heel. Ian Gary was going through the booze. He was going through the conversations of the most hated. And all of a sudden, Colby comes in and goes a little bit lower than Ian Gary. I mean, all of a sudden, Ian's looking pretty good. And by the way, partner, the timeline here really is fascinating. For, for any of our newer viewers, perhaps they don't know. Ian Gary fought more recently than Colby. Ian Gary had a big win over Jeff Neal. He took the microphone with Joe Rogan, and he called out Colby. The reason that's interesting is Colby right there acted as though he had never heard it, acted as though that was the call out, that he's waiting for Gary to respond, as opposed to what really happened, which was that was his response. And sure enough, it worked. By Gary's response, anybody that doesn't know the timeline I just laid out is going to think that Gary's dancing to Colby's tune. I love it. I don't think you could take it back. I think the UFC has something here. I predict they're going to go with it. You know, when you get a bad guy, right, the bad guy can't be the heel that wants to be liked. He has to be okay with the booze. He has to be okay with everybody disliking him. And he's got to be able to smile, walk into the bank while everybody's booing and hating. Kobe Covington has embraced that. You know, I spoke the other day, uh, <laughs> Chill, sorry, I just spoke about Jake the Snake Roberts. Jake the Snake Roberts was such a horrible heel that when the macho man got married to Miss Elizabeth, he put a snake in the cake. People hated him. When the macho, when everybody loved Miss Elizabeth, Jake the Snake slapped her to the point that her parents didn't want to let the macho man go to dinner at their house. 
Colby Covington seems like the guy that would go to Ian Gary's wife and to try and say something to her. I don't believe he'd put his hands on her, obviously, but I'm saying he would say something. And by going at that, right, it seems to be a low-hanging fruit. Seems like everybody wants to go at Ian Gary's situation with his wife. Kobe just digs there, and he digs there, and he digs there. And everybody is taking this kid, Ian Gary, who fumbled so many times that people completely flipped on him, and now they're going, man, if I got to choose between these two evils, Ian Gary's the lesser of two evils. And the whole time, Kobe's laying at home just smiling because he's a heel and chill. He's one of those 1980s, 1990s heels. The ones that when they walked out, the crowd just went crazy and they would throw stuff in the ring. It, it, it's amazing to me. I love it. I think it's perfect. And it really does help to build intrigue in a fight that honestly, I didn't really know if I wanted to see until now. Yeah, I love that you put it that way. I mean, there's a 10-year age difference here. Colby lost his last fight. That's just the truth. Ian Gary has never lost a fight. I, I mean, right, that's a long time of momentum ever. And I mean, I can tell you, Colby really resurrected his career. He was one of the guys, and he was gritty, and he was tough. But, Daniel, you and I and some other ones helped to build a little bit of a bad reputation for a while about wrestlers, that we were dull or we'd take a guy down or we were more about control than we were chaos. And Colby fell right into that. He took the microphone, and he changed the script. And people are wondering, where's the line at? How far is Colby willing to go? And I'll answer that question for you. He's willing to go further than you are. He is not willing to come onto a stage and know that even and Gary could be booed stronger. So he's going to go to a place, no matter how low, that's lower than he's confident Gary will go. I can remember being in the third grade, Miss Stafford at Wilsonville Elementary, but she went onto the board, Daniel, and she told us, if you're ever going to tell a story, you must include five W's. Who, what, when, why, and where. And that's what this story has. We've got everything except for when. I predict Dana White is going to give us a win. Those guys are going to get a date, and they're going to settle that the hard way. You know, Chael, watching these two talk to each other, I just think it has everything. It's a great story. But when building stories, at times, you have a bit of a misstep. So sometimes the good guy ends up being the bad guy. I have flip-flopped on those lines over the course of my career where I could not know my role in the game. But if you have a misstep and the masses turn against you, you may need to play a different role. There's a guy right now in wrestling that's playing a different role. It's The Rock, and he's playing it beautifully. Cody Rhodes, for you, the Cody Crybabies, for your new best friend, the walking clown emoji himself, Seth Rollins, and to your goofy ass dog, The Rock says this, you all are advocates of Cody finishing his story. It's so important. Cody Rhodes, you took something from The Rock. You insulted my family. You took something from The Rock. You took something from Roman Reigns. You took something from the millions and millions and millions and millions of the real fans who wanted to see the biggest WrestleMania event of all time. You took it away. You took it away. And now you're going to pay. Cody Rhodes, from the bottom of my heart, man to man, story Ooh, Cody bleep your story guys that was a 22 minute promo master class by the rock and if hey the people in WWE wanted to cheer him so if that guy can go bad guy chill that says that anybody can go bad guy so it got me to wondering who in the UFC could benefit from a role change in terms of resurrecting their career. I'll start with you, Chael. Who, who do you think should turn heel? And Daniel, there is nothing more monetizable as far as a box office draw than a cool heel. And it's very rare. I mean, you're getting into stone cold uh, territory. The Rock, of course, did it. And it looks like he's going to do it again. But being a cool heel... I think Valentina Shevchenko. I mean, look, if you're talking about a face, somebody with a nice smile that the fans look at a certain way, and you and the higher up that is, 
easier time they're going to have if they go heel. And I just think that she's in a great spot. I'll tell you another angle that always works is athlete versus promoter. The biggest WrestleMania of all time was Hogan oh, yeah. versus McMahon. And the only reason I bring that, I've seen a little of that from Valentina already. Last week, she did an interview saying she's going to accept the role on the Ultimate Fighter. She's going to build this rematch of rematches with Grosso. Maybe an opportunity that she doesn't even deserve and she's not going to do it at the Spear. So all of a sudden, she's taking Dana White's idea. She's good with the opportunity, but she's not going to follow through with the rest of the plans. Created a real headache for him in the office. I just think that's a heel move. And I just think that she has that real ability. Look, you got to have a cold heart to be number one. You got to put your goals and your interests in front of everybody else's. And I only say that because all the greats, no matter how much you like them, they got a few heel qualities. So let's just turn them up a little bit, partner. Joe, you know which one I think would make for a great role change? And I'm not saying he's a classic good guy. He's a guy that, while he is good, he still is kind of just like this. Come see, come saw. Like they say in Louisiana, it's neither good, it's neither bad, it's just kind of normal. Islam Mahachev. Because you know what people hate more than anything? They hate someone that wins and someone that's dominant, and that person tells you how good they are. If I'm Islam, I'm going out and I'm disrespecting all of my challengers. He said Dustin Poirier doesn't deserve it, but he gets an opportunity. I'd fight Dustin Poirier, but I would go the whole time saying, Chael, why I'm going to smash him. I'm going to take your guy that you all look up to and love so much. I'm going to destroy him. And if you do destroy him, then you stick it in their face again. And you talk about how you told them that you were going to destroy him. And you got it done. And you're going to destroy the next guy. Because nobody hates more than someone who wins, but someone who wins and they tell you about how good they are. And I believe that at that point, everybody starts to tune in to try to see you lose. Now you're starting to sell pay-per-views. So opposed to being a guy that is so good, but it's like, uh, I want to watch Islam fight, but I kind of know what's going to happen to going. Oh, man, I hope he loses. Do you remember how much you rooted against the Bulls when they were winning so much or the Patriots whenever they were winning all the Super Bowls? Now it's the Kansas City Chiefs. It's like we want to hate them because they're good. Imagine if Patrick Mahomes is just running around going, I am the greatest quarterback of all time. Forget Joe Montana. Forget Tom Brady. Forget all these dudes. I'm doing what they did in a shorter period of time, and I'm going to be better. It would be amazing because then the Chiefs would go to a different level. But you got to be okay with it. You got to be okay with the booze. Chael, at what point did you become okay with the booze? And did it even sting a little bit whenever you decided to change the way that you were viewed publicly? And Daniel, I feel like you just described possibly a young Kurt Angle. That's what Kurt did so well. And he did it as though he didn't even know he's being condescending. That's when he was doing the whole, it's true, it is. Right after he would say something extremely complimentary about himself that insulted everybody else on the roster. Listen, when you bring up Islam, Islam, much like Khabib, is secretly very funny. And he's secretly very charismatic. Islam was working an angle that I wish he would have expanded on. And all he was saying is, this sport gives out too many black belts. And then he followed up on that. He said, man, you guys aren't very good on the ground. You guys are tapping out. I've never bragged about a black belt. I'll tap you and your black belt out, and I've never tapped out to anybody else. It was an interesting angle, and I wish he would have expanded on it. I wish he would have said, for anybody he's going to defend against, I will put up a gold belt, but you're putting up your black belt. What does that mean? It means if you beat me, I give you my gold belt. But if I beat you, you turn in your black belt. You don't call yourself that anymore. You don't put it on seminars and, and videos and DVDs for technique. That would be wildly interesting, particularly for people in the industry that know how hard and what those black belts mean. I just think that that would be a fascinating angle. When I got into that, Daniel, I enjoyed that so much because I felt like I had a power. First off, I really did believe those things. I had a chip on my shoulder. I felt like this sport owed me something and that it was keeping me away, that I couldn't get those opportunities. I was in the room every day with three different world champions. I knew where I stood. I couldn't even get signed to an organization. So I did have an anger and I did not see it as honorful to, to bow and some of these other things that you hear about respect in our industry. It is a fist fight. It's a cage fight. It's brutal and dirty. Everybody else would bow to your face and put a knife in your back, partner. I believe the honor was telling you to your face that I'm going to put a knife in your back when you turn around, and then I would do it, and I wouldn't even stop to clean up the bloody mess. 
That is the best. You know, for me, it's like I like I was saying earlier, I got put on both sides of that deal, right? Because for a long time, I was the Olympian. I was the guy that was undefeated. And then I got to John Jones, somebody that was the polar opposite. And people just loved him. So when I would go to press conferences, I was almost like Kurt Angle when he first went to the, the WWE and he had the, the three eyes. And everybody wanted him to be the clean cut Olympian. And it just didn't work. But I was telling people what John Jones did wrong, why you should not like him. And they booed me. And it stung. I was like, I was taken aback. I was shocked, Jay. I was, hey, I was sitting up on the stage pr- trying to process how could this be happening? There are 10,000 people in here. They're chewing, the, they're cheering the guy that does wrong. But then I realized that after we had fought, they were still buying pay-per-views because he had beaten me and he had gone on to do more stuff. But then I just didn't care because whether they were booing me or they were cheering me, they were hitting the buy button and they had some sort of emotion connected to what I was doing. Because I'm telling you, for a long time, I don't feel like they cared much outside of the fact that I was a very good fighter. You got to have more than that. You got to be a good fighter. You got to have personality and you need a dance partner. But I just couldn't get it. I could not get it. But once I embraced it, the moment I embraced it, and I told Joe Rogan in an octagon one time, they were booing me in Buffalo. Chael, I had beaten Rumble Johnson for the second time. I said, boo me. I'm getting money and championship belts. And they booed me louder. But then the next time I walked to the octagon, they started cheering because it was like, you can't tell them what to feel. The moment you start telling people what to feel, they will turn on you faster than you could ever imagine. But the moment you don't care, you become the cool heel. You become Stone Cold Steve Austin, the guy that's drinking beer and taking on Vince McMahon, the boss, and they want to be in your corner. It was the most amazing turn that I've ever received. And dude, it was, and then, but then when they cheered me, I didn't really care either. It didn't really matter. Long as there was some sort of emotion connected to a Daniel Cormier fight. And John Jones helped me with that. Yeah, and Daniel, I saw that press conference. I know the exact one that you're talking about when the crowd started <laughs> booing. Not only were you surprised that they turned on that, hey, John Jones sat there. He was just as surprised they were supporting him. And all of a sudden, he steered into it just a little bit, but it was more of a shell than we've ever got him to come out of before. And he's starting to realize, hey, the crowd's into this. They can relate to it. Maybe they understand a guy that makes mistakes more than they do the clean-cut guy. Nobody fully knew what to make of it, but I will tell you this I talked to Roddy Piper one time the late great and I was asking him some of these things about the psychology and this was early in my career around 2009 2010 he told me keep doing what you're doing and he said eventually they meaning the audience will love you for the same things that they currently hate you for he said don't ever change stay on it but once they get on board they're then going to get behind you every story is a good guy and a bad guy and this is what you found out on that stage uh with john jones you assumed you were going to be the good he's coming off a uh, suspension you assumed that he would be the bad but so many times guys have really got to take inventory they got to see because the audience decides who's where and if they want him if they decided he's good then i got to go hard in the the other direction don't try to sit in that front seat with demetrius johnson trying to be the good guy demetrius was the nicest guy there was you got to get yourself in the back seat if you want to be opposite him just a quick example but one that you'll remember joe you know what's uh you know what's crazy you know when i realized that the world of mixed martial arts was something i would never understand i'm doing i hadn't even started doing tv yet i fly down to houston texas I'm going to watch Gray Maynard fight against Frankie Edgar for the third time. I know that Gray is a guy that trained at AKA for a while. He's an All-American at Michigan State. He was close to becoming the champ. I'm the guest fighter. He used to have those international fight weekends, all the boots and everything. I go. I take in the press conference. Brian Stan is on the right. I mean, he's a Navy man. He is a good guy. He is now a CEO of a Fortune 500 company. He is about as clean cut a guy. He's got a square jaw with a box cut. You know that that box cut those dudes be having that go to the military? He looked clean cut. He might as well have worn his military blues up there. He was so American. 
that when I looked over there, I was like, oh, man, I love this Brian Stan. And you walk out there in the everyday I fight T-shirt and you wore jeans. You didn't care to put a suit on. You went up there and you insulted him every chance you got. And then you beat him. You didn't even give him a compliment for taking the fight. You didn't bother to tell him, thank you for all that you've done for our great country. You went directly to Anderson Silva, told one of the greatest champions of all time how much he sucks, and the people cheered. I was like, oh, my goodness. I have no idea what this game is all about. But it was then that I realized you can't do this as the good guy, Chael. You got to do this as a guy that carries a bit of an edge because there was no reason why your ass shouldn't have been booed out of Houston, Texas, but it's that they cheered you. They cheered you and you became a star. I, I appreciate that. That story is really fun for me, but I got to give, I mean, that's kind of what Roddy Piper was talking about. I didn't change. I stayed with it. I stayed aggressive. Anderson did do everything right. I was the one coming off suspension. I was the one in the seat that John Jones was in when you had that experience at the press conference. And I'm just sharing, that's when I started to see that, yeah, if you can stay aggressive, if you have a purpose, if you have a why, whatever your code as an anti-hero, and that's how I viewed my character, but whatever your code is, you got to let the audience know what it is, and then you must fiercely adhere to your own code. You don't have to follow all of the rules out there. You must follow your own rules. And I, I only say that for you because... I think that some guys could do a little bit of a better job explaining who they are, what they stand for. What is their why? What is their purpose? Maybe they don't commit to doing everything right by everybody's rules, but they will adhere to their own. And I think that, that, a, that a hero needs some of those qualities. But Daniel, it takes some lumps in the road. There's going to take some bumps. Not everybody's going to like it right off the bat. And not everybody can get around those boos. It's very hard. We, don't, we see people that want to be heels, yeah. but they can't take those boos. And that's what makes the difference. When they hit that curtain and they hear that wave of boos, guys, I will tell you this right now. You have never experienced anything until you walk out into an arena of 18,000 and all you hear is boo. It's why I ran. It's, I ran because I didn't want to hear it. It's like, I can't take this. But there's also the other side of it, right? The, the cheers are amazing too. But boy, when you walk out to a chorus of boos, it is something you could never, unless you're playing them. The moment I was playing them and... Once I got hip to the game and I started playing them, Chael, then all you want are those boos. And those boos are like, they're like, like, like blood. They're like the blood for you to live that courses through your veins and allows for you to go forward. Chael, that was a great conversation because you and I have experienced this at a different level. But the one thing that when we look back and we look forward and we see what's on the docket, it's amazing that we are now on our way to UFC 300. That seemed like such a far number, but it all started at UFC 1, Chill. Let's take a look back. We're live from the Mile High City of Denver, Colorado, where the weatherman is warning local residents to brace themselves for a huge snowstorm. But tonight, the big storm on everyone's mind is taking place indoors at the McNichols Sports Arena, the site of tonight's landmark martial arts event. Eight of the deadliest fighters in the world will meet in a no-holds-barred combat to determine who is the ultimate fighting champion. Be forewarned, there are no rules, no judges' scores, and no time limits. <laughs> Ooh, chill. Look at that. UFC one. I believe that was Jeff Blatnick on the call. He's one of us, a wrestling guy. What do you remember when you think back to UFC one? Obviously, there's no rules, no time limit, no weight class. But what's your first memory when you go back down memory lane with this? 
So, Daniel, I'm, I'm sure my household growing up had similar rules to your household growing up. But then you had some that within your house were unique and that they were a little bit stronger. Even if there was a whole bunch of rules, but there was ones that were stronger. For my house, you did not skip class. Wherever we were supposed to be, my sister and I, we had better be there. My junior year, I went with my buddy Jeff Williams. I skipped class. I had never done it before. We went down to the movie store. We rented a VHS of something called the Ultimate Fighting Championship. It had happened several months before. It wasn't done live. We took that VHS home. We put it in. We watched it. And it's what you just showed. It was UFC 1. I went home that day. I confessed to my father right away before the school called and told him I cut class. Dad, here's the good news. I know what I want to do with my life. And we sat down and he said, what? And I started to explain it to him. And my dad was a wrestling fan. He only wanted wrestling. I had college wrestling in front of me. But he started asking me, is there wrestling in this? Is wrestling a component? And when I started to sell him and convince him, yes, it's, it's a big component. They call it grappling. But yes, I think that a wrestler could translate. And this is before Dan Severn came in and showed us all how accurate that was. But my father, I did not get in trouble. I did not get in trouble for skipping it. And my father did tell me when that conversation was over, when the next one's coming out, let me know. I would like to watch it with you. <laughs> you know, that's an amazing story because he was proud of you. Oh, my boy wants to be a fighter. I can deal with that. But for me, Lafayette, Louisiana, I was on Irene Street with my cousin Terry. We somehow got a hold of this VHS cassette. Look, man, we used to get WrestleManias after they had already played. And we would get any type of fighting after they had already played. We'd go to Blockbuster Video. There's only one left in Oregon. That In Bend, Oregon, there's one left. I would go to Blockbuster, me and my cousin Terry. We would get it. We'd go into his grandmother and grandfather's room. That's where the VCR was located because they couldn't stay in the living room because somebody might break it. we watch Hoist Gracie, a little skinny dude, do something that we never thought could, was possible. He walked out there with his entire family chill. It wasn't just him. They walked out there, they're hugging, they got their hands on his back, and they're walking him out to fight massive men who he should just not have any chance against, and then he gets it done. I couldn't believe what I was watching because you watch Ken Shamrock, and you watch all these other dudes, and they're so much bigger and stronger. You're like, there's no way this little skinny Brazilian dude wins a fight, and he won. Now, did it make me feel like I wanted to do Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu? Absolutely not. It didn't make me feel like I wanted to do Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. But it did show me that there was a way to win by being smarter than the opponent. I didn't have designs of fighting on fighting until after I was done with the Olympic Games. My goal was to be Olympic champion. And the moment I was done with that, I needed something new. I think what turned me off, though, Chael, if I'm being completely honest, from uh, the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, I didn't like that they were calling it the gentle art. I don't even know what that means. Why do they call it the gentle art? Like, it's, sure, it's softer than wrestling, but don't tell me that I have to do something called the gentle art to be successful at something. I want to smash somebody. That's why I like Mark Kerr. The smash machine, big, strong, take down the hammer, headbutting dudes into the ground. Take your gentle art underneath Mark Coleman and see what happens. Yeah, I, and I'll tell you what, I finished my career at the University of Oregon, but Daniel, I started, I signed my letter of intent and started college at Brigham Young University, and I went out there because Mark Schultz, not only an Olympic champion in wrestling, which my father was good with, but he had a black belt in jiu-jitsu, and I knew I wanted to do this. I didn't know you were, we were going to have to learn to box and kickbox and all the things of our sport today. This was 1994 when I had made this decision. If you could wrestle and you knew jiu-jitsu, I was going to be way ahead of the curve so a really interesting time in our sport i mean there was nothing called mixed martial arts back then if you wanted to do this maybe you get some boxing workouts on a tuesday you lift some weights on a wednesday you're attached to a wrestling program and then a couple of saturdays a year you get in the ring and try to figure it out and as terrible as that might sound it's what your opponent was doing as well it was a level playing field and if i could just give a quick shout out to hoist gracie he is on my mount rushmore but regardless of winning tournaments like that if you make that walk three times Times in one night, you have my respect oh. for life. That would be crazy to go multiple times because your body is hurting so bad. After one, your knuckles hurt, your shins hurt. No. Everything hurts after one fight. Imagine doing that three times in one. Dude, there are people doing that today. 
With the level of mixed martial arts, there are people fighting in tournaments. I think that is absolutely crazy. But hats off to all the people that started this. And guys, the UFC put out this great promo that goes back to UFC 1 all the way to UFC 300. It is beautifully done. You should go watch it as soon as you get an opportunity. Guys, before we go, Chael and I will be back next uh, later on in the week from Kansas City. But before, wrestling is this weekend. But there was also wrestling last weekend. My boy got himself a state title last weekend. Little Daniel became the SC Way State Champion last weekend at 140 pounds. Chael, 12U, 140. The boy went in there unseated. The number eight seed was able to go through one, able to go through four, able to go through three in the finals to become a state champion. And the joy that he had on his face, Chael, was so gratifying for me because when you watch your son and the work that they put in accomplish what they want, it's so good. You can buy them anything, but they earn things like this. And yesterday, Lil Dan earned that, man, and I was very proud of him. So, Pop, I love you. Congratulations on your championship. It's an accomplishment you should be very proud of. Uh, Daniel, I, I am envious that you guys had that experience. Congratulations, Papa, because I know it went into that. I saw your son four years ago, wrestling room at the American Kickboxing Academy, and I knew it was your son. There was an explosiveness. There, there was a way that he held himself. There was a way that he held him his face. Even when the going got tough, he had grit, and he would stay in there. And one thing about it from that one practice that I saw, but I remember four years later, he did what the coaches asked him to do. He did not make those decisions on his own. He had trust. And I just know as a coach, but as a father, when you can be part of something that your son is doing, and he trusts you, you're on the outside giving him instruction and he's doing it because he trusts you that has to be awesome i hope i get that same feeling someday you will absolutely get it bro it is the best thing in the world hey chael another awesome show i love this one because we got to talk about some of the things that mattered and played a huge part in our career guys every week monday thursday new episodes of good guy bad guy youtube espn plus espn2 and everywhere you get your podcast for, for Chael Sonnen, I'm Daniel Cormier. We'll catch you on the next one.